Hello everyone, I'm Audrey Dissitour from Toulouse in France and I'm going to talk about decision making in acellular slimals. So first of all, what are slimals? So there will be for a very long time to be plants and fungi. Some scientists even thought that they were half fungi, half animal. In fact, slimals since the 90s, we know that they belong uh, to a kingdom called Amebozoa, which diverged a long time ago even before animal and fungi uh, separated. So what you're looking at here, it's a unicellular organism. It's quite difficult to believe considering its size. In fact, it's because the cell contains lots of nuclei. It's a multinucleated cell. And all these nuclei divide in synchrony every eight to 12 hours. So it means that the cell is doubling size every day. We have an exponential growth. So here is an example. You can see a 10 meter square simul that was given as a present to a professor that was retiring. So we don't know what the professor did with this simul afterwards. Mm -hmm. So here is a simul crawling in its environment because simul are moving around. So here it's a video that has been sped up, sped up because the simul in fact reached speed of one centimeter per hour in average and sometimes a maximum speed of four centimeters per hour. What you can see is that when slimals are, are crawling around, they are expanding the network of veins. If we look at this network of veins inside, you can see that there's a um, liquid moving, and this liquid is in fact the cytoplasm of the cell. It circulates nutrients and oxygen within the cell. If you look at the sense of circulation, you will see that it changes uh, in time. Like here, up, it goes down. In fact, this um, change in direction happens every 90 seconds. It's called the shuttle stream. So this movement of cytoplasm within the cell are generated by the contraction of the vein. And these veins, in fact, are made of actin and myosin fibers, and they contract. And by contracting, they are pushing the liquid around. And it's also the motor system of the slime In fact, if you look at this video, you can see the membrane progressing on the substrate. And you can see that the membrane is doing two step forward, one step backward, two step forward, one step backward. And in fact, it corresponds to the shutter streaming system. And in fact, the slime is pushing the cytoplasm, taking it back and pushing again. And that's like, like that, it can move around. So the slime uh, have also, uh, has also a sensory system to monitor internal and external cues. And they're able to detect stimuli in the environment, such as light, humidity, temperature, pH, osmolarity, mechanical stress, and uh, also chemical substance such as nutrients. So when uh, nutrients are present in the environment, the slime mold can follow them, uh, can follow the gradient, and is using for that chemotaxi. So here is an example. The slime mold is facing different fusils. The red one is the best one, and you can see that the slime mold is going directly to it. In fact, the slime mold can fix a little concentration of nutrient diffusing in the environment and follows the gradient towards the food source. So in the first part of my talk, I'm going to talk about decision making in a foraging context. And in the second part of my talk, I'm going to talk about decision making in a social context. So let's talk first about for a foraging context. In psychology and animal behavior, there's a relationship that is very famous, is a relationship between decision time and accuracy, the famous trade-off between accuracy and speed. So usually when you make a decision and if you're very quick, you have a higher probability to get it wrong. You're quick and slow. While if you take time to ponder the option to compare them, you can become more accurate, but you, uh, in contrast, you're very slow. So you have to make this trade-off between speed and accuracy. And this trade-off will also depend of, um, on a third parameter, the task difficulty. For instance, for instance, if a task is easy, it's very uh, easy to get to be quick because option one is far better than option two. When the task gets difficult, it's kind of tricky because you have to, you have to spend time comparing both options, but you still have a high probability to get it wrong. So then we can um, show this uh, relationship between task difficulty, decision time, and accuracy. So here you have when task difficulty increase, decision time usually increase too while accuracy decreases. In fact, when it's really, really difficult to make uh, the difference between two options, you will ponder for a very, very, very long time, but still you will have a higher probability to get it wrong. So we study this uh, relationship between accuracy, speed, and task difficulty in slime. 
So for that, we pick three strains. So here we are, the Australian, the Japanese, and the US, uh, the American strain. And so here they are just exploring an homogeneous environment. There is no food. And what you can see straight away is that they differ in terms of speed. So the Japanese slime is very quick, while the Australian slime is super slow. And the American slime is in between. There's also a difference in morphology, but here today we will only focus on speed. So uh, here are the results. So we quantify the speed by using a software to track automatically the shape of the slime mold, and we were able to measure the time to reach a distance of three centimeters. And you can see that the Australian slime mold is three times uh, slower than the Japanese slime mold, and American slime mold is slower than the Japanese one, but is still relatively quick. So what we did after was to phase our strain with different choices. In fact, in total, we uh, used diff nine different choices. And they were um, considered as hard when the options were very close and the concentration in food and nutrient was almost equivalent. And were considered as easy when the difference in concentration between the two food sources was pretty large. So here are the setup. You put the slime mold and the two food sources are two centimeters away. And usually what the slime mold is doing, it's growing a pseudopod with a fan-shaped uh, structure. And as soon as it touched the food source, we uh, say that the slime mold made a decision. So here are example in the video. So you have the Japanese slime mold and the Australian slime mold. So the Japanese slime mold is very quick to decide, but you get it wrong. While the Australian slime mold takes time and you get it right. So this is two examples. So here are the results. So on the x-axis, you have the task difficulty. On the y-axis, you have decision time and accuracy. So as the theories predict, uh, decision time increase with task difficulty, except for the Japanese time old, while accuracy decreases with task difficulty for all the three strains. Interestingly, you can see that for the um, Japanese time old, when the choice is uh, quite hard, it cannot solve the task and you just pick randomly one of the two options. If you now look at the result within strain, so here you have the task difficulty again, and here we have the three different strains. And you have the, you know, on the y axis, you have the decision time. So the plain circle represents when the slime mold made a correct choice, and the white circle uh, represents when the slime mold made an incorrect choice. You can see that the slime mold is quick. When the slime mold is quick, it has a high probability to make an incorrect choice. Well, when it's slow, the slime mold is usually making a correct decision. So we also have this trade-off between speed and accuracy within the strain and not only between strains. So here we were able to show that slime mold differ consistently in the exploratory behavior from fast to slow explorers. So now in the lab, we have more than three strains. We have 10 strains, so we can really have a continuum in speed. And we are still uh, investigating this question of speed versus accuracy. So we show in this experiment that slow explorer made more accurate decision than fast explorer, and that slime molds integrated food cues in time and achieved higher accuracy when sampling time was longer. We were able to show that the Australian slime mold, in fact, is more informed than Japanese slime mold because it spent time uh, integrating information when you explore its environment. So let's talk about now a series of experiments done in a social context. Indeed, when as, uh, people are studying stimuli that the slime mold can perceive, uh, nobody so far were interested in how slime mold could perceive their congenial environment and if they could signal each other when they are close, uh, in a close distance. So this is the question we asked with my PhD student, David um, Vogel. So what we did was just to face a slime mold with a spot of agar where a slime mold has been exploring before. And uh, against, we put an empty spot. And what we noticed that the three strain went directly to these uh, cues left by congeners. They were very attracted by this spot. And the strain slime was more attracted to congeners than the other strains. What was also interesting is that the cues themselves left by um, slime were not equivalent because the cues left by the strain slime were far more attractive to the other slime no matter the strain. So in fact, the uh, Australian slime mold is more attractive, uh, more attractive to congeners, but is also more attractive to congeners. So after we face the slime mold, uh, uh, be, um, no, we face the slime mold with a choice between cues left by congeners and food. And surprisingly, 
we noticed that the Australian and Japanese cyborg were, pref uh, were preferring cues left by congeners than food, while the American cyborg uh, preferred to go to food. Only 15% of the cyborg went directly to the cues left by congeners. So, uh, in fact, when we were looking at the literature, we uh, noticed that slime mold were releasing calcium when they were exploring the environment. So we were wondering if calcium was not the cues that slime mold were using to locate uh, congeners in the environment. So we measured the, um, the quantity of calcium excreted by all the strain, and we show that the Australian slime mold is in fact releasing four times more calcium than the American strain, for instance. So to, to we had first demonstrated that calcium release was different, but we were, wanted also to check if calcium attraction was different um, between the strains. So we put a spot of calcium against an empty spot, and we noticed that the Australian cymos were better at detecting this spot of calcium in the environment than the American cymos. So to finish the story, what we did was to repeat the first experiment, so cues left by congeners against an empty spot, but this time we put EDTA in the environment around the spot. And so the EDTA is a chelator of calcium, so it means that it blocks the calcium on the spot. And this time the slime mold was not able to go uh, to, do, to locate its cue left by congeners and picked randomly one of the two spots. So why releasing information in the environment? So in fact, we designed an experiment this time where we put two slime mold together and they had a choice to make between two food sources. As these two food sources were uh, similar. And what we noticed with the Australian slime mold, the most social one of our strain, is that in 80% of the case, the slime mold would focus on the same food source. They wouldn't distribute random in the environment, they would just converge on the same food source. And a uh, second uh, interesting result was when the slime mold was alone in exactly the same setup, it would have trouble to find the food. And in fact, it would take two hours more to find a food source when he was alone than when he was with a congeners. So it seems that the slime having a congeners around was helping uh, it to find the food source. So we uh, demonstrated that slime mold can sense their congeners in the environment and that slime mold excretes calcium in the environment, which is attractive to congeners. So which is the cues that slime mold are leaving around. So the information supplied by this excretion, this calcium, allows slime mold to coordinate the activities and detect the food faster. So it's a bit like a cooperation system. So with my postdoc, Lea, we were wondering if these social cues can vary according to the physiological state of the slime mold. Because in our previous experiments, the cues left by, uh, by slime mold were always coming from a happy slime mold. It means that the slime mold that was well fed. So it was in a very good physiological state. So what Lea did was to confront the slime mold between two types of cues, cues left by a happy congeners, a well-fed slime mold, and cues left by a starved slime mold, a slime mold that didn't feed uh, for 24 hours. And what she shows that it was 96% of the slime mold went straight to the cues left, left by a well-fed slime mold. And in fact, she demonstrated that the cues left by a star slime mold were not neutral, but were repulsive because only 6% of the slime mold went to these cues and explore these cues first when they were facing an empty spot. So after we were uh, wondering if the stress uh, experimented by the slime mold was always um, perceived by the other slime mold depending on the physiological state. So what we did was to change uh, the physiological state. This time we didn't play with food, but with poison. So we wanted to know if the slime mold could sense the health status of another congeners. So uh, slime mold were poisoned with caffeine and we let them explore a little spot and we faced this spot against an empty spot. And we noticed that uh, in this experiment, only 27% of the slime mold went to the cues left by poison slime mold. So he was able to sense also that the slime mold was in a poor health status. And the last stress we tried was light, because light is very bad for slime mold. So what we did was to irradiate slime molds first, and after let them explore a little patch of agar, and fa we face this patch of agar with an empty spot, and we let the slime mold decide. And here, in 24% of the case, the slime mold went to the queue left by congeners. So again, he was avoiding, in fact, uh, this part of the Petri dish. 
So in this experiment, we were uh, able to show that thymol release clinical cues in response to stress that can be sensed by conspecifics. And thymol actively avoid environment previously explored by stress clone mates. And so the use of social information provides thymol the way of gathering information about the environment and its potential danger with a limited amount of risk. Because in our experiment, so Simon that had to pick between these two options never experimented the risk himself, but he was able to avoid an area where Simon had experimented the stress before. So to conclude, we've uh, demonstrated that Simon are decentralized systems that can make decisions. And uh, as um, uh, many collective sy uh, systems, Simon exhibit symmetry breaking and social signaling. So even a primitive organism like Simon can do that. And so the decision-making process in SIMOL are reminiscent of what is observed in collective systems such as end colonies. Because we know that when end colonies are facing two equal food sources, for instance, they always focus the activity on a single food source and they also use social signaling by, uh, via pheromone to signal their congeners where the food is. So I thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't go over time. <laughs> and bye-bye uh, to all of you. And before leaving, I want to thank uh, all my students and postdocs who've been working very hard in the lab, repeating all these experiments. Uh, and it's really, really time consuming and I really thank them. Bye-bye.